Welcome. My name is Jonathan Zwicker. I'm the director of the Center for Japanese Studies. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to have our speakers here today. I will introduce them in, in just a minute. Uh, but before I do, I have a couple of announcements about upcoming uh, events and deadlines that I'd like to make. Uh, the first is about our ongoing film series at the uh, State Theater in partnership with the Michigan Theater Foundation. The name of the series is Cinemanga, which is to say films drawn from the pages of manga, as, as they like to say. Uh, this is ongoing through April every Wednesday night at 7 at the State Theater. Next week will be Lone Wolf and Cub. Uh, the second uh, announcement is about an upcoming uh, academic workshop uh, on Kodai, that is to say ancient Japan, which will be happening on February 12th, uh, 9 to 5. That's uh, open to the public, but you need to pre-register. So there should be flyers for all of these events on the table. If you're interested in this uh, workshop, please uh, pre-register for that. The following day on February 13th, we have a uh, Tsukaru Jamisen player coming, that is to say a player of, uh, of a Shamisen style from northern Japan who will be coming to give a public uh, demonstration. We don't have the flyers for that printed out yet because we're doing it in conjunction with University of Chicago and we haven't gotten the information from them yet. And then in March, March 22nd, we have a Taiko ensemble coming um, from um, the northern Japan uh, to, as part of our um, uh, commemoration of the fifth anniversary of the tsunami nuclear disaster, which obviously has tie-ins with the panel today. And then finally, two uh, more announcements. The first is that uh, the first episode uh, of our new podcast series has finally um, been put together and released. It's available through, uh, you can get it from our homepage, the University of Michigan Center for Japanese Studies homepage through SoundCloud. Uh, this is a discussion between uh, Professor David Laney, uh, who's here, who's uh, one of the Toyota visiting professors, uh, professor of political science at Princeton University, and then our former colleague, uh, Professor Kenneth McElwain, who's now at Tokyo University, but up until last year was a professor of political science here, and they're discussing the revisions to the security law uh, that were under discussion in the fall. And then finally, uh, for the students in the audience, um, we have a new internship initiative, and the deadline for resumes for that uh, is on February 28th. So if you're interested in doing an internship over the summer in Japan, please write to the Japan Internship Initiative, which is just Japan Internship Initiative at umich.edu, uh, and send in your resume and a, a cover letter for that. Now to today's uh, presentation. Uh, actually, one more event is tomorrow, which is a continuation of what we're doing today, uh, which will be a discussion with our two presenters, Ben Matsuzaki and Shinsuke Iwai, and then with Professor Nick Tobier of the Stamp School of Art and Design. And this is part of the stamp, Penny Stamps lecture series that they do, which is usually held at the Michigan Theater because this is a sort of a regular part of what they're doing. Uh, tomorrow's event will be held at the Rackham Amphitheater at 6 p.m. So please, if you're interested in these uh, discussions, tomorrow will be a more a kind of a broader discussion about some of the connections that we can draw between work that's going on in Japan, northeastern Japan, and work that's going on in Detroit, uh, and the roles that universities can play in facilitating uh, some of these revitalization efforts. So today's speakers are, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Shinsuke Iwai and Ben Matsuzaki, who have come all the way from Japan for this. Um, both of them are extremely distinguished professionals. Uh, ben Matsuzaki uh, did his uh, BA in economics at Tokyo University and an MBA at Yale, and then worked for a long time in IT uh, and consulting both in the San Francisco area and in Tokyo. And he's now president of Herman Miller Japan. Uh, many of you know Herman Miller is actually a Michigan-based company, so we're particularly excited that he was able to come and be part of this. Uh, Shunsuke, Shunsuke Iwai uh, has a background uh, in sociology from Keio University and has worked in, a, uh, in advertising uh, for a very long time. Uh, first at Dentsu, uh, and then most recently he's creative director of a very, very major IT company um, uh, that you will have heard of uh, that's based in Silicon Valley. He's the creative director for their Japan operations for strange contractual reasons. We can't actually name what that company is, um, but it's a very, very famous company that you're all uh, intimately familiar with. Uh, so. 
Um, we're very, very happy that they were able to take time out of their schedules to be here today. I want to mention one last thing about this, which is that uh, many of you may have been here in the fall and October uh, for Gota Matsumura's discussion of the work of Ishinomaki 2.0. And this is kind of a continuation of that. I actually was not able to come to uh, Matsumura-san's talk that day because I was in Tokyo at the time. And just coincidentally, um, ben and Shinsuke were in Tokyo at the time doing a presentation about what, the, what work was going on in Ishinomaki. They called it Little Ishinomaki. And I had a chance to go to their discussion, and it really just totally blew me away. Uh, the, not just the work they were doing, but the way they were thinking about the work, about sustainability, about the role of pro bono work, about the role of making, uh, kind of re regaining employment, making it sustainable through creating uh, companies in uh, Ishinomaki. And so at that time, I thought, oh, it would be great if we could get them here. But I was really thinking long term, like next academic year, through a series of sort of strange events, uh, which I won't go into, it happened that they were able to come now. Uh, and so we're really, really um, very grateful for them taking time out of their schedules to, to come all the way here and to take part both in the lecture today and in tomorrow's discussion, which again is 6 p.m. at the Rackham Amphitheater. So without any further uh, ado, let me introduce Ben and Shinsuke. Um, okay, I, I'm Ben, Ben Matsuzaki, and also the, uh, here is my pro bono uh, partner, Shun Iwai, and uh, we are bo both uh, visiting a uh, university. This is, some, some people say this is one of the greatest public universities in the United States or on this entire planet. I feel very honored. Um, oh, partly, yes, because uh, this is a good university, but um, partly because I'm from Herman Miller, which is a uh, Michigan-based company. As a matter of fact, it's only like a couple of hours from here. It's West Michigan, and uh, we have two um, colleagues uh, just driving down uh, for this event um, today. Um, and uh, um, the reason why I'm here and he's here today is uh, not to just talk about um, some local stories. Yes, they are local stories, but we believe some of the lessons we've learned or we are learning still um, can uh, apply to other parts of the world. Um, and then this university is very close to um, Detroit, which is another very, you know, um, um, in a difficult uh, situation now. And I just hope um, what you, you are learning today, uh, you will learn today, um, can be used um, in um, Detroit and uh, for the university and for the community. Okay, so um, maybe uh, I should just uh, start uh, with a few slides and then he will take, or maybe I will go back and forth, but um, please do not hesitate to stop us and if you have any questions, although we have uh, like a 30 minute Q&A session, a little more, you know, uh, interactive way, um, but um, please uh, let us know if you um, have any questions or comment during the uh, conversation, okay? Okay, well, this is the agenda, very short agenda. So um, we'll just share the case studies with you, just four stories, four short stories about new ventures um, um, starting up in Ishinomaki. And uh, some of them are incorporated already, and some of them um, to be incorporated soon. And then after that, just make it you know, uh, more like an in, uh, interactive discussion uh, followed by Q&A. So by the end of this one and a half, a little, li little less um, session, you will learn uh, what I've experienced, what I've learned from those uh, uh, different case studies, and he's learned those case studies. And then hopefully um, think about what can we do based on those uh, in this area of uh, the country. I think uh, um, very, very briefly, I'm president of Herman Miller Japan. Um, I'm in charge of Japanese and Korean operations as, as well as part of Asia. Um, I, I spent most of my time in Tokyo and Korea, um, but I'm part of Herman Miller. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a furniture company making furniture and not those ones, but um, we see some uh, uh, Herman Miller furnitures, furniture out there. Um, Herman Mella are uh, always trying to do something beyond the day job, trying to do something for the community. Um, so this is part of our, our, our job or our mission 
to be here and uh, sh to share knowledge outside of our business. Um, okay, well, can you just, yeah, I think I, I should, I should do this. Yeah, maybe I should, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah, this is the technology his <laughs> company has created, so. <laughs> It's it's there's done this growth. It's yeah. it's not Herman Miller. So um, should you might wanna yeah say a few words. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, Jonathan for introduction. And uh, I've been in the advertising business for almost uh, more than two decades. I've been in the copywriting. Uh, my major client was Nike and Google and Toyota. And currently, I'm, I'm working at the some com companies. And then the. <laughs> After tsunami in 2011, it was March 11th, 2011, the, uh, my ex-colleague uh, at Wine and Kennedy, my ex-agency of advertising, uh, introduced me to the Ishinomaki. I was blown away, actually. So, the, of course, it was terrible, terrible disaster. A lot of lives were lost. But uh, as a creative person, I found white vacant sketchbook there, right, so that I could draw anything on it. So the, it was just a starting. So the, then five years have passed, next March, uh, it will be fifth year. But I was uh, in charge of helping the organization, of course, Ishinomak 2.0, and the I'm, I'm doing a couple other things now. So that was my yeah. introduction. Very good. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, Maybe I can continue, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, let's talk about Ishinomaki um, briefly, uh, where it is and what it is like and what it was like after a tsunami. Um, so I'm sure you want to. So maybe some of, the, uh, some of you uh, have been to Japan, but this is Japan. And then, so you go up to north. This is Tokyo. Imagine you take a blood train, uh, 1.5 hours from Tokyo to Sendai, and then you switch the train to Shinomaki. Here, there's a, a relatively bigger peninsula called Oshika Peninsula, and then this area is the Ishinomaki city. And this is the aerial view of Ishinomaki. So the it's facing the ocean, actually the part of the Pacific. So tsunami came from here. The unfortunately, you know, it, the it's wide open area uh, toward the ocean. So the almost every beaches were attacked by tsunami. And uh, the more than that, there's a big river called the Kitakami River uh, running. This area is downtown towards the north. So the uh, unfortunately tsunami uh, went up to the downtown and then hit the city. So <laughs> just just to give an idea um, in a relative way, and uh, the left side is Ishinomaki and uh, um, it's a smaller city um, with a population of 145,000 people. Uh, probably a third of the size of Detroit, or a little less. Um, this is Ishinomaki in 1950s, uh, when the Ishinomaki economy was booming. Obviously, the major industry is not auto industry, and that was uh, fishery. A lot of boats, uh, fishermen's boats, and then now we see a fraction of those, only like a few boats left uh, in that uh, uh, city. And then this is a long queue um, in front of the uh, department store. So the commercial uh, uh, business were uh, very, very um, active and, uh, and also the growing uh, during those uh, industrial era. This is a population. Um, now, as I said, the population is 140,000, but it used to be much, much, much more than that. Obviously, one reason is the earthquake and the tsunami. They lost thousands of people and thousands of homes, or more actually, and the small businesses. So this was taken just a few days after the tsunami hit the area. Uh, so tsunami, as you might know, is a big tidal wave, but it's not like a usual wave coming in and coming out, it stays there. And uh, also, I if you have an inlet, um, a tiny area, um, and then tsunami comes into the inlet or river, and the amount of the, uh, the water stays the same, but it's going toward the, uh, the narrowest point of the inlet. And then the height could be you know, huge. 
Uh, in case of uh, Ishinomaki, the highest point tsunami hit was like uh, over 130 feet. Just, you know, imagine how high it is. Uh, it's almost like a 10-story building. And uh, Ishinomaki was the, uh, the hardest hit uh, among those uh, uh, municipal um, cities. Um, and uh, nearly 4,000 people were lost or uh, still um, um, uh, missing. Very quickly, those are temporary houses. The government uh, fairly, fairly quickly um, built those temporary houses. Um, very tiny, but clean enough and uh, cozy enough for those uh, people who lost uh, their homes. But what I want to emphasize is not tsunami and the, 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 uh, the earthquake, but even before the earthquake happened, Ishinomaki uh, or any other cities in the northern part of Japan had experienced um, the decrease in population, not only a population, but decrease in GDP and jobs. So this is the common issues uh, um, seen in Japan, or maybe most of the uh, uh, post-industrial um, countries. So this is uh, the typical um, shopping street. No people, no stores. They're all gone. Uh, it's not because of tsunami, but because of those uh, post-industrial era uh, syndrome, I would say. So, um, question is, uh, was that the end of the end of the end of the world, or was that uh, once in a lifetime opportunity? I think uh, yes, both are true. But the way the way we see it uh, is, it was or well it is a once in a lifetime opportunity for some people, uh, especially highly aspirational, uh, young, talented people. And then um, after tsunami uh, left the city, um, a mothership uh, was born, which was um, Ishinomaki 2.0. Now it's the central piece of uh, everything in Ishinomaki. So um, Shun will talk about uh, Ishinomaki 2.0 briefly. So uh, after just a few weeks uh, of the tsunami here, and the, the Masazaki-san who came here, how, how long ago? Right. October, so the, he came here to have a lecture. Masaki-san was the, uh, uh, the young guy in the Ishinomaki who uh, running the NPO. And then the uh, couple of the younger generation, the uh, business owners, uh, local business owners, and then um, someone who came from Tokyo as the volunteers, the uh, uh, who are specialized in the marketing and the creative, got together at the Tsunami Hill restaurants. The you know the second floor of this restaurant, who actually had the 300 years history, could survive because it was second floor. They got together there and had a discussion. What shall we do? How can we make this city survive? So, you know, it's just a few weeks after tsunami, so the basically it was disaster, you know, that people went to shelters, you know, people suffering for food and more clean water, they didn't have bath, they even didn't have electricity. But you know, this kind of discussion already started. So they formed the organization called Ishinomaki 2.0. The first thing they started was they built a space uh, where the people can get together uh, to work, to talk about the future, to interact. So the, um, the first job I did was naming of these places so that they came to me saying, hey, Shun-san, we have to name this place, so the what shall we do? So I gave this place a name called Iloli Ishinomaki. Iloli is, uh, maybe you know, the, it's a Japanese fireplace. And the basically, the, you know, the old houses in Japan Traditional houses in Japan, almost every place have this kind of fireplace in the living room, tatami living room, where the you know the kids, the grandpa, grandma, or the family get together to talk about what happened today, or they you know uh, interact. They tell the story in the community, the story of the folklore, or this kind of thing. So that I wanted to make these new shared spaces 
in the middle of the devastated uh, the Uh, become a new generation of Iroli in the fireplace. Because I'm a copywriter, I came a little bit different way. So the Iroli also uh, is the abbreviation for interaction room of revitalization and innovation. So next thing that came up was okay, you know the lot of volunteers from around the world is gathering in the Shinomaki and a lot of the uh, local people has no place to go actually because they are still in the shelters so that they came up with the idea of you know, why do we have a place to drink in the evening everybody need a beer especially volunteers everybody is human yeah. so the in the evening after long tiring volunteer work you know the all the clean up the streets and the helping the local businesses you know at least they need some place to drink so the and this is amazing. In the complete middle section of the devastated city, they built a bar, which is called Fuko Bar. Fuko is revitalization or reconstruction. So actually, this place is very, very tiny. I can say this is one fifth of these spaces. So how many people? Just ten people uh, uh, is enough. For, you know, sometimes people overflow to the street uh, outside this bar, but it, it, it was nice feeling actually. So imagine there's no electricity, you know, the the it's completely, you know, the destroyed. But uh, there's one tiny bar there, you know, you might go there, right? So that this place was built completely DIY, do it yourself. Why? They actually, you know, the Ishinomaki Lab, Ishinomaki Laboratory, which in the most section will take you through later, a couple minutes later, and um, after this, and uh, they will work together with Matsumura San of Ishinomaki 2.0, then build this bar. And this bar still there, and then the still beer, uh, it's, it's a magnet for, uh, for people and the visiting the Shinomaki. And the Shinomaki 2.0, and also uh, organizing annual summer event. Uh, actually, the Brad here, and, the university and he was summer intern for this event two years ago, right? 2014. And then annually uh, that they held, uh, they hold uh, this uh, summer event. First year in, the, in 2011, so that there was nothing. So the, uh, they, were, they had only uh, abandoned the building, so that was uh, washed away. So the, uh, we used the uh, wall of the abandoned building to turn, in, turn it into the outside uh, outdoor cinemas because kids didn't have any entertainment at all. There was no entertainment in the shelter. Of course, the families, parents didn't have any entertainment at all. So, you know, kids had nothing to do at all. So the, uh, because we were in the advertising business, we had a little connection with the movie company, content holders, so the, uh, they were so generous. Amazing series of movies, like Back to the Future, to the Doraemon maybe, you know, or the kids' movie for Japan. They were volunteering the films, and uh, we, we ran the films there. So they, uh, we also had uh, some lecture series, workshops. It actually, this was in the train. We chartered the JL, Japan Rail Train, uh, to have a lecture series in the train, all this kind of thing. And they had, uh, I know the uh, Detroit had a uh, uh, throw roll, right? The bicycle event here, right? But uh, we also had a bicycle event, like we call the uh, Oshika Potaling. And then the <laughs> what was amazing, uh, last year, this is a picture of last year. So the they completely uh, brought back the traditional bamboo um, ornament. So the bamboo ornament is traditional uh, summer festival. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the because of the tsunami, you know, there was no one who can actually afford to make it or if we can continue uh, this tradition. But at uh, Ishinomaki 2.0, as an organization, uh, they worked together with local people to bring this tradition back. So the I hope this tradition will continue even this year, this summer, and, there and then on to the, uh, onto the future. So uh, Ishinomaki 2.0, uh, as we said, this is mothership. So that this is where everything started. Then little by little, there's a couple of the uh, different organizations and uh, the spin off from this organization. One great example is Ishinomaki Love. It's a community furniture studio. 
And then it will not, I will uh, explain this later. Uh, it's an IT educational organization which can teach kids about how to program the uh, mobile application, the web applications. Hiori Kitchen is a restaurant and uh, who is run by a female architect uh, who actually moved from Tokyo to Ishinomaki, a member of Ishinomaki 2.0. And she started this restaurant and uh, using local recipes. And then another example is this is a very recent example. It's a new spin-off company uh, called Makigumi, who is and um, specialized in the real estate dealing, um, because the the in some people moving from other side, uh, other part of the country to Ishinomaki, so they need a place to live. But there's a lot of the vacant spaces, vacant rooms in the Shinomaki, so that, that their role is speak to the landlord or, the, uh, or, or, or apartment owners to say, hey, can we renovate this space for the newcomers? So all these kind of things. That this is uh, the work of Makigumi. And then the, uh, you know, we have a couple of the organization around the Shinomaki 2.0, but uh, you know, more than that, they have networks outside these, you know, the Ishinomaki local organizations. They have a connection with other NPOs and the organization, and the public sector, the Ishinomaki city or officially association, all this kind of thing. So, and then the some local businesses, many of them were hit by tsunami. However, you know, the uh, some powerful in the company came back uh, in a few years. So that they have uh, uh, frequent the communication, the interaction with these local uh, local businesses, and then pro bono people like me and Ben, so uh, who are keen about helping them, and then of course educational institute like universities and the uh, local high schools, and I hope that this University of Michigan could be one of them from now on. So and um, then the we're gonna take you through four. Uh, interesting case study of the unique uh, organization which came from post-tsunami Ishinomaki. So one example is a very significant example the, um, where multinational pros joined local people. So the, this is Ishinomaki Lab and Ben will take us through there. Thank you, Shun. Um, yes, uh, there are four initiatives and um, the top one um, I've been uh, involved uh, with is a, a company. Actually, it's uh, not an NPO, not a CSR um, entity. It's a company, corporation, full profit company, corporation called Ishinomaki Laboratory. Um, th it's a it's a maker of uh, furniture, um, very well designed, uh, beautiful furniture. But it started as more like a DIY station for the locals, a uh, public uh, um, um, space, um, so that people can come in and use the uh, power tools and the uh, timber. Um, Herman Mella donated uh, lots of those uh, at the beginning. This guy just hanging the, the sign is an uh, architect um, based out of Tokyo, but he happened to have a client in Ishinomaki. So he just came up with this great idea, just uh, opening a public DIY studio. And then he and I had a discussion right after Tsunami, and uh, okay, great, let's uh, make it public for now, or uh, maybe uh, uh, forever, but uh, let's um, create a new business or a new small industry here in Ishinomaki. Um, that was the initial conversation, and here is the logo. On the upper right corner, there is an opening. Uh, that means it, it's open for public, but it's not entirely open for public uh, because uh, we wanted to make it a for-profit business at some point in the future. Oh, just very quickly, this is Herma Mella. It's a huge uh, um, uh, Michigan-based uh, furniture company, but um, you see at the end of the, the line, our design tenet is um, to solve problems. Uh, we make and sell um, um, well-designed products, but not designed for design, but designed to solve problems. So that is our DNA. So when I met Keiji, the architect, um, starting up Ishinomaki Laboratory, we the very first thing we did was to identify the problems we could fix. I visited those newly um, built temporary houses, um, hundreds of thousands of houses were ready and then people were just moving into those houses in summer after after the earthquake and I met a group of local NPO people identifying those issues there are a bunch of problems 
Uh, the one very visible problem was, as you see, the houses are, are built uh, on the base. The base is about one and a half feet. So when you uh, stretch yourself um, to the rack um, and then dry the washing, you may fall. Um, if you, as a young person, uh, just fall, it doesn't matter. It's only like one and a half feet. But if uh, just imagine a short senior citizens just trying to do the same and uh, fall, and then they may break their legs, and it could be a very serious issue. So that's a physical problem. Okay, furniture um, can play the role. But second issue is uh, a little more challenging. They lost community or sense of community because the new neighbors are not uh, previous neighbors. The neighbors are totally reshuffled, so you don't know each other. So they tend to stay inside and get depressed. That is uh, more like, like a long-term problems. The third one, even more challenging, the loss of employment. The tsunami washed away not only houses and people, but also the local businesses. So thousands of uh, uh, small companies will uh, just gone. So this is this is something given to us, uh, to the architect and to Herman Mello. Okay, what can we do? And then we started working with the uh, designers and the creators uh, to come up with the solutions, the physical furniture solutions. This is one of the original drawing um, by a uh, local, very talented, not local, um, um, Tokyo-based uh, designer. And then this is a bench. And the bench was installed like this to fill the gap and also the, uh, to help people um, communicate with each other. Those two ladies are not neighbors. They didn't know each other. Actually, I did. I I just uh, bring in this uh, bench a few hours before uh, I took this picture. I left it. And then the, the left person uh, lives in that house and the right person just came and uh, saw the nice bench and just sat down and started talking to the you know someone she doesn't know. Great! And another example, um, after making those uh, benches and stools and uh, another designer working for her mamela, actually she's um, based in New York City, very famous designer called Aisha Bursell. Aisha just uh, sent me a note and then, hey Ben, uh, why don't we create uh, some portable thing, portable table maybe, so that people can, can bring uh, the table to the neighbors and say hi and uh, maybe have a beer or coffee. Great. And then she flew to Ishinomaki one day, organized a workshop with us and with the kids, and then she made those furniture pieces. So those are the initial, well, one, uh, just two out of like uh, um, 20 uh, different examples. And um, this is what we did to solve those fundamental problems. And then we organized a workshop. Rather than just giving away those furniture pieces, um, we, oh, means uh, um, myself and um, 11 other Herman Miller employees from all over the world spent like a half a month uh, after the tsunami and then uh, made 470 pieces of furniture um, I just uh, introduced. And then worked with the local people because I wanted to tell them how we, we, we can make those furniture pieces so that, you know, even after we left, they could um, just do the things on their own, DIY. So as I promised, um, we incorporated this as more like a for-profit um, business. The reason is, just wanted to make it sustainable um, and then um, we just uh, um, wrote down mission statement, actually, because uh, this is a serious uh, um, startup and a venture, I would say. Um, there are a few lines. Uh, we don't have to you know, just read them through. But some of them are now for profit. So it's about shared value. It's for the community, giving something or knowledge or space to the community. Um, but to of them. The last two lines are more like a capitalistic value, capitalistic um, um, objectives. So we declared we make money. We sell furniture and make money. Because this is the uh, um, going concern. Um, it must be sustainable. But at the same time, really wanted to make sure uh, this works as a public space. 
as well. So still, um, Ishinomaki Laboratory is functioning uh, uh, as a public uh, DIY uh, lab for kids and for the local high school students. And this is oh, too long, but testimonial from a local high school uh, the stu uh, teacher teaching in a um, tech school. She said something very interesting. Um, every time the students um, join the uh, workshop in Ishinomaki Laboratory, they grew tremendously as if as if education in school was uh, subpar and ineffective it's a it's a word from a teacher teaching them and then she said uh, for the students collaboration with the first class designers in a life in a, a once in a lifetime opportunity so um that is why i said it could be a once in a lifetime opportunity not only for the students but for the locals Yes, uh, businesses are going concern. Um, so if you want to make it something sustainable, um, just incorporating that entity, if you can, would be one, one option always. Yes, uh, the business side of this uh, corporation, just uh, very quickly um, show you the products um, they have, we have. So those are the products very nicely designed um, by the uh, first class designers inside and outside the country and are winning uh, lots of uh, projects actually um, left hand side you see the uh, um, um, number of uh, um, sofas that was uh, sold sold to uh, Yahoo uh, a multinational company it's just one of the uh, um, uh, tens of examples that we sell um, And now the business is expanding outside the city. And the picture left left hand side is uh, their Tokyo showroom. They are now expanding into Tokyo, the largest market in Japan. And also they are going out of Japan. Um, and then I think it's a Monaco, yeah, Monaco magazine article. And then they went to uh, Paris and they found uh, um, um, dealers in uh, in London, um, Switzerland. And now um, an American um, retailer is interested in the uh, um, the product. So um, yes, this is this is how probably not the only way, but this is one of the ways to make uh, your activity sustainable for a long time. And our people, yes, uh, um, we have uh, a few people in the organization. Uh, now we have like six or seven people working there. But they are supported by the uh, the local residents still, and children, um, high school kids, as well as local NPO and local businesses, and customers. More importantly, but um, I think uh, their key resources are not only those people, but um, pro bono, um, including myself and left hand side. The lady is a lawyer, um, very very good lawyer, working in Tokyo. But for whatever reason for some reason she really wanted to um, spend uh, um, her time to help this local business and lots of creators architects and product designers this is why this company is succeeding now um, and growing actually I just paused one day and just wondered why this is happening um, General compassion is like this. Ooh, okay. Oh, I think uh, maybe it's time to stop my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, general compassion is like this. Always uh, it happens. Uh, people tend to forget things. Um, and then general compassion always uh, comes with uh, cash as a donation. Or maybe manual labor, just removing the debris and uh, whatever. And then, oh, yes, as I did. People send hygiene kits and those uh, you know, necessities. I did all of them right after the quake. But it goes down very quickly, very sharply. Look at this. Guess what it is? This is the actual number of volunteers traveling to this city. <coughs> yeah. This is a reality, but I wouldn't blame them for not coming back, because there is no reason to come back. But one day, we found something totally different, something growing, something come to the, coming to the city. 
more and more. It, it's hard to name it, uh, but it's a, there is a growing meaning of opportunities to help rebuild the community. Or maybe this is compassion and the other is uh, resonance, maybe. So when you resonate in someone's heart, people are willing to share whatever they have, maybe cash or energy or knowledge, professional knowledge. So then different kind of cash is coming in. It's more like cash as investment into those corporations uh, through maybe crowdfunding, not a traditional conventional way, or creative work. Or maybe professional services, um, lawyers and accountants, or maybe business development like uh, uh, like me. This is this is this is what I've found. Okay, um, we, we should be uh, a little optimistic about this. Uh, 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 after knowing this, and uh, one more thing, from Herman Miller's point of view, why are we doing this? What? What, if any, what's the benefit? I, I hate to say benefits, but th there must be benefits. Otherwise, we don't do this because Herman Miller have been doing it for years, not only for this one. When ca uh, Hurricane Karina hit uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, we sent a bunch of people um, 10 years ago. We've been doing that every single year. So why is this? This is my, it's not an official statement of Herman Miller, but my personal uh, view. I think uh, the stakeholders, including uh, employees or maybe shareholders or management, want to do something, something you know, beyond the bread and butter day job. And the companies seeing solving problems rather than creating problems can have a better chance to survive. So uh, th there is a reason. And then the formal increases, sense of belonging, or the the latter um, increases um, reality. Uh, that's a reality. I think that's very true. So what I'm saying here is uh, we, oh, we, not Herumela, but um, people from Ishinomaki, for instance, can take an advantage of those, knowing this, right? Um, and then people say, oh, this community needs uh, talented young people and money from the uh, co bigger corporations, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, those people, young, talented people or big corporations, need the community. It's the other way. So uh, this is this is the probably the biggest uh, um, lesson I learned uh, through this. Oh yes, please. <coughs> oh okay. They they are my colleagues from Herman Miller, West Michigan, and after the quake, uh, I and Herman Miller sent a bunch of people from all over the world, from the UK, from the US, and uh, help uh, establish the uh, Ishinomaki Laboratory. So that was a picture taken during our mission, yes. I was part of the team, yeah. I'm sorry, this is uh, linked to a little bit earlier, but um, I know that um, the company Herman Miller and, and the stuff, I understand the for-profit stuff, and it's very cool that they do these projects. I was wondering about the initial housing you were talking about. That was by the local government, correct? That's correct. How did that work? I know you had mentioned that a lot of the uh, uh, employment had gone down. Was the housing rent controlled or was it kind of like um, temporary to help move in or how, how did the housing work? Um, they call it a temporary housing, okay. but still there. Um, and uh, it, it, it could be used another two, three years. Uh, it's semi-permanent now. It's okay. given to the, uh, the people uh, for those homes. Uh, obviously, they cannot stay there forever. Uh, it's not that durable, but they could stay there for like uh, seven, eight years. Yeah, is that is that your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering. So, like, but they um, do they pay like rent to the? Oh, actually, no, no they rent, no and rent. So, when they plan on moving out, will there be um, projects to help mm. in the new places? That's correct. Yeah, they subsidize that move and the new houses. Yes. Okay. So uh, now the next one, um, Shun. Um, so next example is, you know, the of course the IT is one of the key things there, uh, which is very important. So uh, oops. 
So it, uh, the organization called Itonav uh, ITNAV. Uh, Itonav is uh, uh, is the organization where the uh, people will teach the uh, how to code the application for mobile devices and the web application to kids and then who is like from elementary school to the uh, their early twenties. So the objective is nurturing 1,000 IT engineering in the Shinomaki by 2000. 21, which is 10 years after the tsunami. This is their objectives. And the more than 100 students have already joined the program since uh, January 2012 where, uh, when they started. So the, what they're doing uh, annually, you know, they, they have uh, you know, the day-to-day -day classes or day-to-day -day courses. Uh, adding to that, they have uh, Ishinomaki Hackathon. Maybe some of, them, uh, some of you uh, might have heard this word, Hackathon. This is where the, uh, uh, the IT developers uh, join. It's like a marathon to develop the application for you know, things like this, the mobile uh, devices and the web application. And they compete. The uh, winner can win the award or, or, or some uh, reward. Or sometimes that, that things can be an actual product uh, to be released. So they have uh, annually this, in this kind of summer event, the uh, renting the spaces uh, in the school. What's great about this Itonab activity is actually the youngest participants are elementary school kids like them. So the, you know, and the one great example is, uh, I remember the one kid uh, who is actually uh, 11 or 12 years old, uh, built the application for, for Android platform and they, he released the, his game in the Google Play. So that actually the people can have access, people can play with his game. And that can blow. Uh, that can bring him a, a great confidence. And another aspect of Itonabu is these, you know, the global player uh, in the IT business uh, that uh, actually helped uh, them as a kind of pro bono volunteers. Some of them, uh, you know, um, joined this activity as a completely individual, uh, not just uh, as a corporate uh, activity. Some of company, you know, helped, like a Google, Google Japan, actually helped them as a corporate. <coughs> and this tech pro, and they occasionally came to Ishinomaki to teach kids how to code the application in a very, very professional way. And uh, sometimes the company like uh, Olympus, the SoftBank, SoftBank is the one of the major uh, the uh, mobile carrier in Japan. This company could uh, uh, could uh, provide all the hardware. And also, this is the current state of the Itonab. So the Itonab is just uh, uh, more than ten uh, members. It's still very tiny. A company they they actually incorporated a couple years ago. Well, you know, the traditionally in this kind of IT industry, the you know when you are a small company outside Tokyo, and uh, you have to work for Tokyo companies as a kind of subsidiary, like a basically you have to beg for the job to Tokyo company. But what's amazing for this uh, Itonab activity is they're actually skipping Tokyo, so the. This summer, um, also last summer in 2015, that they sent one the very prominent guy to the company in Los Angeles to learn, of course, from the languages, uh, to how to work in the IT industry in, 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 in the global sense, actually. And then now uh, reaching out to the Europe now that they're trying to uh, join the hackathon in the Finland. Maybe some of you know the Finland is now very huge for this kind of application, especially the gaming. Maybe you know the you, 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 you have expressed to play with Angry Bird or something like that. Angry Bird is actually from Finland. So the, you, know, you know, this kind of thing is actually happening right now. So this Itonav, this tiny company that who were born after tsunami, is trying to reach out to the company outside Japan, skipping Tokyo. And you know the uh, this kind of activity can include all the kids you saw in the couple of slides before. So the this is quite a uh, great experience for kids, uh, local kids in Nishinomaki. So talking about the youth, uh, there's another example, this third example, which is uh, inspiring the youth. It's called, oh sorry, 
not working well. So Ishinomaki School. So this is the uh, emblem of Ishinomaki School. Uh, the, the center of the, uh, this emblem is the same as the logo of uh, uh, Ishinomaki 2.0. So that means this school is uh, born in the Ishinomaki 2.0 organization. So this is the uh, educational program where the high school kids, local high school kids, learn what teachers want to teach you at school. <laughs> so uh, the, the main point is learn what they want to teach you at school. So the, the, the program is that they have three points here. Meet and get inspired by local innovative business leaders. Plan and execute your own community events get real world skills to develop and present your ideas. So basically, uh, the what's significant in Shinomaki is all high school in the Shinomaki is public schools. There's no private school at all. That means they are completely tied with a uh, traditional school system which is organized by government. I can say this is the same as 1970s or 1960s, unfortunately for kids. So the uh, problem people like us went to this uh, organization to meet kids and uh, to inspire them in the very, very real world way, in the, you know, in the 2015, 2016 way. And then the, uh, the, for the second point, plan and execute your own community event, the, uh, some of the students actually did very interesting events by themselves. One of the example is Ishinomaki Collection, which it's, it's a runway fashion show completely organized by uh, local high school girls only, and conceived and planned, executed by local high school girls. So the, the, all the outfit they showed off is seemed, uh, of, uh, they have seemed of uh, Shinomaki, like an uh, ocean of nature, the, all the streets. And then the, it was very, very well received by local, and a couple of medias came to cover uh, this event. And another example is Alice in Ishinomaki Land. As you may know, like the story, you know, the Alice Kells, Alice w Wonderland. So these girls, the high school girls, they actually they turn the streets of Ishinomaki into the world of uh, Alice. So it's a kind of city walking tour for a smaller child, like, you know, the kindergarten child, children. But you know that they uh, toured together with parents and all these Ishinomaki school girls, and then they turned all the street into the world of Alice, uh, telling the story. And the small kids uh, actually really enjoyed the story. So this is me. But uh, and the another aspect of this Ishinomaki school is uh, probably persons like me uh, went to the classes uh, to teach how to organize your thinking or ideas and how to deliver your idea to the other people. So the, because I'm in the advertising business for 20, more than 20 years, so the, I know how to present your idea to the client, but this time it's not to client. But uh, you know, if you have an idea, just show your idea to others, so the, in a very professional way. Of course, you can teach the professional presentation in just the three hours or so, but at least you can, you can get some kind of hint out of there. So that's what we did. The lastly, uh, this is the one that, uh, the last example of the four uh, case studies of Ishinomaki, is something outside the city. It's, it's something uh, about the beaches. So in the bait, one of the oldest industry maybe in the world. So it's called the Trident Project. Actually, I named this project. So it's the it's the idea to reinvent the Japanese fishery industry over the uh, last uh, couple of decades because of this and the industrial era. Uh, the fishery industry in Japan keeps declining. The people getting aged. And because of tsunami, especially for these areas, because of tsunami, they lost the boats, they lost their uh, properties, they lost their uh, factories to turn the uh, oysters into the product. So a lot of people gave up their businesses. But imagine, can you imagine the Japanese without the sushi, <laughs> right? We need the fishes, we need the fishes. <laughs> so that somehow we have to make this industry sustainable. That this is not, not just for Ishinomaki and the Tohoku region, this is a nationwide problem. 
go to the every official village. Everybody has the same problem, aging and the degrees of the number of the fishermen. So they came up at the idea to nurture a new generation of fishermen, building shared houses, introducing a new training program, and creating a new recruiting method. One thing they started is this. So the uh, advantage of this area is actually they have a lot of abandoned houses. They have a lot of houses. Actually, they have owners, but the owner gave up using them. So they came to the owner saying, hey, you know, that if you have houses which you are not using now, can we rent it? And they can renovate it because, as he said, Luckily, we have a lot of the very talented architects around the Ishinomaki, so that you will have a lot of the luxury to choose from them. The one of them can completely renovate this abandoned house, turn it a little bit. It's a very simple way. You know, you don't have to spend fortunes at all, right? Just make it modern. Just make it comfortable to stay, because it's very traditional industry. A lot of the older fishery houses, it's very, very, I can say, a little bit smelly deli, right? <laughs> but <laughs> you can make it, you know, the nicer, they can bring new people in. So they, they can attract a newer generation people. So they actually, there are three, we call it Triton bases, Triton houses. Actually, three Triton bases are in operation now. And then, sorry, this March, very soon, uh, they will start at uh, the new Triton base. Uh, it's going to open in March this year. So this place, this is a planning drawing. Uh, this place will have a shared house for new fishermen. And the recruiting center. Recruiting center is uh, the will be open the collaboration wi as a collaboration with city office and the local fishery association. And uh, soon, in the future, they will have a community kitchen where the local housewives and the uh, senior citizens can come in to have a cooking uh, for the communities. And then we, we may have the lodging facility as a kind of Airbnb kind of style lodging. So uh, talking about the houses, these three, uh, the flags, is a typical uh, officially bought flags, but it's very, very in a modern way. So this is designed by my uh, colleagues of my company, who is an uh, art director. His name is Gino Wu from Hong Kong, uh, who actually got education in the U.S. He was working in Tokyo, Shanghai in the U.S., so he's kind of global, you know, a little bit renowned art director. And he designed these flags per each houses. And this guy is a mayor of Ishinomaki City. And the uh, rest of them are the uh, individual fishermen, independent fishermen. So what's significant about this project is uh, unconventional collaboration among global creatives and the grassroots activity and the public sectors. In the public sectors used to tend to ignore this kind of activity because they have stick, uh, you know, they have to stick with the, uh, you know, the idea of being very equal, right? They they can't work only with certain in the association or organization because they're you know, basically uh, living on the tax money. But uh, you know, the after five years, after four years, four years uh, these days, even the public sector cannot ignore this kind of activity because we're actually contributing, nurturing the new fishery industry. So the finally, the public sector, like a city office and the fishery association came to this trial project. Hey, why don't we collaborate? So the first step was, the, as I said, the uh, recruiting center. So the let's see, you know, it just started. So the let's see how you know, younger people can apply for this program. So the actually, we already saw a couple of new fishermen came in to this, in this, uh, to this neighborhood. So, Mr. Sam, maybe, yeah, I can take over. I think uh, they're considering the, uh, the time uh, left. Um, we should very quickly um, go through the key ingredients. Um, I don't think it's, this is the only ingredients, but um, we, we, we as, as far as we know, the creativity is uh, very important. Um, the creative director is necessary. Uh, not only are the real creative, but maybe just business creativity is also the key. 
And uh, the second one, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are very, very important. We need a uh, um, highly aspirational young people. Not necessarily young, uh, could be old, but uh, people. <laughs> and education, uh, it doesn't mean uh, uh, they need to be educated, but we need uh, support from educational institutions, and we need to support the educational institutions as well. So that's a key. Um, and a pro bono, pro bono workers um, from outside um, the city, from all over the world, hopefully. So those are very important ingredients, maybe more, but um, this is what we found. And then uh, those four activities and corporations have them all. Um, challenges, yes, we need more job opportunities and still people forgetting things uh, but it, it's not it's not bad news uh, we, we need different kind of motivation um, and the sustainability and also the scale scalability is the key because Ishinomaki is not huge but uh, still it's a big city uh, and um, Detroit is much bigger so we don't want to just uh, um, keep them as a boutique um, entities uh, we need to expand the business um, So, yes, we are in the post-industrial era. And now, um, this is actually based on Herman Miller's research or somebody's research will probably uh, give, you know, give us the same kind of conclusion. We see this way. We are getting out of already uh, finished the uh, era of industry. Now we are getting into the era of well, like ideas. This is my definition of a post-industrial era. So, um, what's important is not huge amount of cash or machines anymore but um, people's ideas and passion something out of the people so this is this is something happening now then um, we, we need to come up with the solutions well, okay what are the new success factors in this new era era of ideas era of uh, you know post industrial so what, what, what's that? Um, I think uh, we are getting into the uh, Q&A or maybe discussions. I mean, maybe I have uh, better ideas, uh, if any. Oh, please, yes. Actually, um, it's kind of related, but I have a question on it first. Um, I understand what the post-industrial era is, but how do you define post-industrial era syndrome? I'm not quite understanding. OK, well, um, OK, just one local example, Detroit. OK, General Motors, well, there. And then they've created uh, um, tens of thousands of jobs uh, in the past. But now what? I don't know. Uh, it's only a fraction of those, partly because of the uh, um, globalization, um, and, and uh, or partly because of the shift of those uh, um, jobs uh, to California, maybe. Um, so that's one of them. And as a result, um, there's a big issue of un unemployment or inequality. Um, so those are the, the, the issues we see everywhere, yes. Is Herman, is Herman Miller in Detroit? Uh, Herman Miller is in Zeeland and Holland, West no, Michigan. But then in this, in this context of uh, going into the city and uh, trying to create uh, um, yeah, that's my hope, and then that's why I invited uh, two of the colleagues from West Michigan today, uh, because we'll just go visit uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, the the NPOs uh, later today. Yes, um, hopefully. You know, in the in the seventies, uh, Isamu, Isamu Noguchi uh, designed a uh, plaza in Detroit, very beautiful. Oh, um, I didn't know that. It was uh, a jewel. It's, it still is somewhat of a jewel there. And um, uh, during the, uh, uh, in the last 40 years, it has become a uh, dilapidated. And um, there are um, objects mm -hmm. built, you know, sculptures, uh, uh, sort of defacing the place. Interesting. Uh, and uh, it's uh, right at the entrance uh, to the city in by riverfront. And everybody's talking about, you know, we, were, you know, we want to renovate the riverfront. Uh, there is uh, some money and whatnot. And um, 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 there is a certain I I uh, amount of uh, uh, blindness mm. to this space. Mm -hmm. It's 
it, it's beautiful. But, uh, but uh, it um, has all these things built around it, um, trying to revitalize this space. Uh, they've done the opposite. Hmm. It's repulses. Oh. Nobody wants to go in. It's it's. Uh, oh. it's uh, That's uh, a shame. No. It is. No. Uh, so the the difficulty is somewhat deeper than uh, right. not enough jobs. Uh, yeah. It's uh, not seeing what is precious. Oh, I see. Thank you. You have not seen the. Uh, no, the no, I haven't. Hearts are plaza. Plaza. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, what you're doing in Ishinomaki just sounds amazing. And it also sounds like there's tremendous talent and human resources in Ishinomaki. So this combination of local and um, outside, outside yeah. is wonderful. But um, I'm wondering why Ishinomaki? And um, just because we know that there were many areas in That's Iwate, great. Yeah. and are are companies like your own or other companies also doing pro bono work in other places, or is Ishinomaki lucky because they have a great collection of human resources? Um, I think uh, in a relative term, Ishinomaki is luckier. Um, um, more fortunate uh, in terms of the uh, the number of people coming into the city than other areas. But um, I know there are a few other very successful ventures um, born in other areas. Um, so it's not happening only in Ishinomaki. Uh, but for some reason, um, people like us um, are more in Ishinomaki than in any other places, probably because of the uh, um, what, what do you call that cluster effect? It was you have like a few very good people, and then they bring in other other people. Um, um, they hit it off each other. So yeah, that's happening more in Ishinomaki. I can I can two things about that. So they are you know the two factors I think and in my opinion like one is in the relatively accessible uh, from Tokyo. It's in the geographically it's closer to Tokyo, and the, it's uh, maybe the biggest city which is more accessible to Tokyo. The second reason in the Ishinomaki was, I don't know the reason, but uh, it, it became uh, the, uh, the center for uh, the uh, overseas volunteers, foreign volunteers, which maybe, you know, they had a little bit, you know, the open feel to the outside world. So the, uh, these two things, they were, were something I can think now. Thank you. So, um, first, thank you for your presentation and for Sorry coming all the way. Um, I, I'm from France and I'm working on a dissertation right now about the role of the creative industries in the revitalization of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So it's right uh, in my topic. And I have one commentary, small commentary, and like one or two questions. My commentary is that it's not entirely true to say that we live in a post-industrial society. I mean, it's, it's a debate in the academic community, but like industry is still the, like the sector of the economy that makes yeah. the yeah. most yeah. value. Yeah. So, I mean, capitalism is changing, but it's still not exactly a post-industrial era. I just wanted to say that. Then my questions were, um, you said that um, like companies seen um, resolving problems and not creating problems uh, can survive uh, better. So I wanted to know why do you think that? And so is it because consumers uh, become more and more conscious about what they want to buy and about yeah. about companies? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one different example from different industries. Uh, if uh, you have a choice between two coffee shops, one is uh, fair trade, the other is not, um, some people um, still want to go to the other one because cheaper, because it's cheaper. But more and more people uh, prefer now the uh, fair trade um, um, companies and philosophy um, paying even you need to pay a bit of premium. So that's happening now. I think uh, the, the, the background is slightly different from like uh, 20 years ago pe when people didn't care so much about the, uh, the impact, social impact, negative impact uh, of those corporations created. Um, yes, so that's my understanding uh, of 
why this is happening. Um, yeah. Hi, I, uh, I've been working as a real estate broker here 30 years. I, I'm originally from Japan. Um, I am very interested in the uh, statistics uh, you showed in the beginning of the slides um, in comparing uh, both uh, uh, Detroit and uh, Ishinomaki. So we'll um, um, Ishinomaki is only one third uh, of Detroit. Yep. And <laughs> but we, you know, Americans know Detroit has too much land. Within uh, the oh, yep. city, city boundary with Detroit, um, you can fit Manhattan or five boroughs of New York oh. and San Francisco and Boston. And we oh. still have more land within the <laughs> same, in, oh. within boundary of Detroit. Oh. And oh, I'm sorry, and Ishinomaki is bigger than Detroit? In, in terms of area, it's a huge. Uh, uh, yeah, because they actually merged the a couple of the village and the yeah, towns. Yeah, but, but the Detroit merged too, and, <laughs> you know, and yeah. Detroit has only seven hundred fifty thousand people. Now look at the Manhattan. Yeah, they have five million, <laughs> eight million. <laughs> Boston, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a huge number of population in those three cities. Right. Detroit has only seven hundred fifty. Well, and Ishinomaki yeah. has three times bigger than <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Detroit. Mostly uh, those uh, mountains and... Uh, yeah. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm curious. Um, and uh, the lady just asked you a question about uh, why Ishinomaki. Mm. Um, you know, very close to Ishinomaki, there's a big city called Sendai. Right. And Much why not huge. Sendai? That, that's my, my question. And uh, there are other cities along the no, you know, northern you know, uh, seacoast. Uh, 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 relative to uh, Sendai, which is huge city, actually um, about thirty minutes from Ishinomaki, um, Sendai is w wealthy. So the government reacted very, very quickly because uh, they just sent a massive amount of people and uh, just uh, you know um, supplies to the the disaster area within Sendai. So they helped themselves. But Ishinomaki had you know, no budget, um, much less budget, I would say, and uh, people, um, because uh, the center part of Ishinomaki was hit by tsunami. So even the city hall was gone. Um, so that's a major difference. You know, Ishinomaki, in a sense, needed to start from scratch. Um, Cincinnati, oh, excuse me. I think it was the University of Cincinnati or it was Ohio State, one of the two. They worked with uh, JASCO, the Japan American Society of Central Ohio, to help build a playground in Ishinomaki for the kids oh. to play in. Um, you were mentioning some projects that might be helpful. Um, the children in Ishinomaki still don't have a lot of places to go to play. Mm. Um, if they could design some more structures like that or opportunities, even maybe at that school mm. um, that you'd mentioned uh, for the children to play, that might be something that they oh, could. I didn't know. Thank switch. you very much. Oh, yeah. Playground project? Okay. I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> just make a quick. I wanted to make just a very quick comment about this question of why Ishinomaki, which I think is a great question. But it was something that came up uh, when I heard their presentation in October. Um, and I may be getting some of the details wrong, so please correct me. But I think two of the key players were talking about how they had met each other, the architect and the ur urban um, planner, had met each other, I think, in Shikoku. Is that right, Tokushima? They were already oh, working. Yes. Th okay, they were already working on a project um, that had nothing to do with the earthquake and nothing to do with the tsunami, the nuclear disaster. It, 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 this is getting back to, to Ben's really important point that these changes were already happening. <coughs> we're, we're, we focused for very good reasons because of the devastation, the loss of life, on the events of 311. But actually, those are part of a much longer uh, and bigger story. <laughs> and so it, it's not just Ishinomaki, I think, is one of the points. It's all kinds of other places, smaller projects that are going on. Uh, the redevelopment of Mukojima in Tokyo was one of the things that they talked about that evening. Uh, and so to, th to think about this in, in, I guess, broader and also comparative terms, I mean, that's part of the reason they're here is for this conversation tomorrow about, right, you know, 
Detroit has never gone through anything comparable to what happened in northeastern Japan. And the point isn't to say that it has. The point is to say that these sorts of structural problems are happening mm -hmm. everywhere. And so, yes, I mean, I think it's probably right to say Ishino Monkey is in a certain way kind of lucky to have this. Um, but they've also been themselves willing to capitalize on this. That is to say, they haven't excluded people who've been willing to help and, and mm. come in. Mm. Yeah, can I say about it, something about it? So the basically, you know, Japan's traditional system is a kind of hitting wall now, hitting the ceiling. So the we're suffering, you know, for the growth in the in the traditional way, right? So the uh, we still have the bigger company corporate. Now some of them are still profitable, but uh, you know, the some of them suffering, especially you know the electricity hardware. So. The, all this kind of thing um, that gave a kind of feeling to the general public, you know, they need something else. So the uh, we can say, you know, the at the looking at the countryside, there's a, a kind of collection of a tiny, tiny revolution kind of feeling. The Tokushima, Tokushima Prefecture, for example, is a good thing. Like, you no, know, it's not just uh, the revitalization of the uh, small community in the older m way. It's more like you know the completely new way of re revitalizing. So the uh, there's no clear answer to the uh, to the method for that. But uh, you know the Ishinomaki is one way, or, or there's another another community uh, for doing that. So the you know the I personally believe that you know the collection of these small tiny revolution can ultimately bring the bigger movement to the country. That's my personal hope, actually, in which cannot be delivered by Tokyo. It's a very interesting moment of time. Hi. Hey. Um, is this on? Yep. <laughs> uh, I think the um, hurricane, or the um, tsunami, hit a long uh, piece of coast. I don't know how many miles uh, the coast was. No, what was it? Miles. 300 yeah. miles? Yeah. Okay, so that means there's a lot of other cities that are within that devastation zone. So have these ideas from um, this city been uh, incorporated or have they migrated to other cities to do similar things? Um, Ishinomaki is not necessarily the, the center of the uh, revitalization in along the coast. Uh, there are um, spontaneously um, some other places where people are doing the similar things, so just starting up the business or rebuilding community in a new way or a traditional conventional way. Um, but Ishinomaki, um, uh, 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 as, uh, as a business, those uh, a few initiatives uh, uh, want to get out of the city and then do more outside the city and then bring in the resources um, from other parts of the world. Um, I think uh, independently, um, any other cities are doing the same, uh, or s even the small villages with a few initiatives. Um, one of them is, for, for instance, uh, um, called uh, Kesenuma City. It's an further north. and then, um, Someone just starting up the business and knitting. Um, she and a bunch of uh, the local people uh, just making a, a sweater um, because that was part of the culture. Now they want to just expanding the business outside a little city and then just going abroad and selling a lot. And so it, it's happening everywhere. It's Ishinomaki is not the only place where you see those. Uh, Another example is the, the Trident project for the fishermen that so I showed. Like it's very scalable, so that you know that it can be adapted oh, yeah. to the any fisherman village, not just for Ishinomaki. So the the plan is, you know, that if we can make success around Ishinomaki, we can uh, export this kind of idea to the outside Ishinomaki. So that that's another scalable idea. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.